was a little, uh, a little, fat, a little heavy, uh, uh, and I apologize, but uh, I wanted to end up with those remarks. Uh, um, in, in, in gory detail, everything I said is contained in, in a 100-page paper uh, I wrote recently with uh, the Neff, Monten, and Son. Uh, so this is a rather recent result. I was told in the school we have to say the old and the new, so this part was the new. And now I'm going to talk about the part that is, is, uh, is not even new because it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> which is the piece that we need to understand. Um, but um, so lecture four is the static patch. And I'll make some, so this is going to be a slightly more conceptual uh, piece of the discussion because um, we just don't have a theory, okay? Um, and I'm a fan of mathematical models, but unfortunately I have not quite, well anyway, let's see how far we get. Um, so the last equation we wrote down Um, was something I used the words I cheated I used the words consider entropy even though I haven't really told you what that is. Now, if we go back to the first lecture, you'll remember I drew a Penrose diagram, and I noticed some of the causal properties of this space. Okay, uh, and I said that an observer doesn't have access. An observer living inside a consider universe like us in the current phase, if it's dominated by uh, dark energy uh, uh, does not have access to the full space. And so much of the thanks. thanks. Much of the discussion we talked about before was living outside the, the outside the regime of accessibility of, of the observer. Now, interestingly, we ended up with a vastly reduced amount of information producing the full space of data in this universe. Uh, but I'd, well, I'd like to think now a little bit more locally, okay? What does the universe, an expanding universe, look like from the point of view of a, an in, an, a local observer? And in fact, as far as I understand in the history of the subject, the, 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 the first the sitter universe that was written down was in fact written in a static coordinate system. So the Sitter and Einstein were debating whether or not there was a static universe, and uh, Einstein built his static universe, but it was unstable, and then the Sitter told him, well, if you include the cosmological constant, you can produce a static universe. <laughs> so to him, the Sitter universe was static, I think, which is kind of a funny... Later, later he also, I think, understood that it was a, a time-dependent universe, but of all the cosmologies, of all the FRW cosmologies, the Sitter is the one cosmology that not only allows for a, a time-dependent description, but also a completely time-independent description, at least of a region of its space. And, and, and the, the, the expansion of space cleverly adapts itself in these static uh, coordinates in the form of a cosmological <coughs> horizon. Okay, so we're sitting here, the supernova are getting redshifted, everything's being pushed away. At some point, they become so redshifted that their signal competes with the Hawking radiation of the Desider horizon itself, and essentially the information is lost. Uh, and so this is a horizon in all senses of the word, except we're living inside of it, and there doesn't seem to be a singularity anywhere. So it's a, it's a rather clean and interesting horizon, and, it's, and, and it carries an entropy according to Gibbons and Hawking, uh, uh, which, uh, which in our own universe is supposed to be uh, 10 to the 120, which means that we are uh, surrounded by 10 to the 10 to the 120 microstates, <laughs> if this picture is true, and uh, somehow we're not mixing with them. <laughs> uh, Okay, so might be a little odd of a picture. 
Uh, now, a quick way to see that this uh, uh, geometry or small fluctuations in this geometry have thermal properties is to uh, consider a wick rotation to Euclidean time. And what happens to this geometry when we wick rotate to Euclidean time? Well, what happens to this geometry is, uh, for one thing, it becomes Euclidean. <laughs> and uh, another thing is that, well, when r equals 0, we have a 2 sphere that caps okay, to a point. But when r goes to 1, uh, we would have uh, a conical singularity unless we make a, a particular identification of the Euclidean time uh, to be uh, 2 pi. So in order to have a smooth Euclidean continuation of our Lorentzian geometry, uh, we need to identify the Euclidean clock by a periodicity of 2 pi, and thus uh, Green's functions will have this uh, property as analytic functions of time, uh, they will be periodic in Euclidean time. Now, this is uh, a hint of, of thermal behavior, right? When my Green's functions are periodic in Euclidean time, I'm dealing with a system at a finite temperature. And another remark about this Euclidean geometry is that you can convince yourself, for example, by calculating its volume, which is going to be finite now, that it is actually the full metric on the Euclidean force sphere. Okay? Now, just for fun, this is going to be a fun lecture. Uh, uh, because we did a. Uh, so, just for fun, let's uh, go back to the global description of the, of the De Sitter uh, universe with the three sphere shrinking and growing again. And now let's do a different continuation where we take the cosmological clock time and we continue it uh, to i times t, tau, some other Euclidean object, what do we find? Again, we find a Euclidean geometry. And tau, in order for this to be uh, smooth, again, has to obey certain properties. Okay, because cos, unlike cosh, goes to 0 at two points. And again, you'll identify this as the standard metric on S4. So what just happened? We, we took two different patches. <laughs> we took the local patch of the sitter, Euclidianized it, the horizon became a point. For the point to be smooth, we needed to identify the Euclidean clock, and uh, we found the four sphere, the round metric on the full four sphere. Then we took the full global geometry, we Euclidianized it, the pieces that had to do with the infinite expansion in the past and the future capped again, and we produced the Euclidean force sphere. <laughs> so, curiously enough, uh, though the, the, the same Euclidean picture of the force sphere uh, produces two dramatically different Lorentzian descriptions. Okay, that's entertaining. Uh, okay, but I'm going to focus on this one. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> oh, and just for the fun, in our universe, I told you what the entropy is. I can also tell you what the temperature would be if we were dominated uh, by the De Sitter horizon. It would be the coldest substance known <laughs> uh, ever, I think, 10 to the minus 29 Kelvin. I think is the number, <laughs> homework problem. Uh, so it's a pretty cold, highly entropic uh, horizon that surrounds us. OK, good. Uh, so for those, if, uh, I guess this isn't a crowd that does uh, low temperature condensed matter physics, but <laughs> I can't make the joke. Uh, so. So 
So, okay, so some other properties. Some other properties of this space. Um, this space is isolated, but we can put some matter inside of it. Okay? And uh, just for the sake of simplicity, we can consider the case where we put some uh, spherically symmetric matter localized within the, the horizon and uh, ask what the metric outside of it looks like, which by the Birkhoff theorem is going to be the Schwarzschild de Sitter geometry. Uh, <coughs> And the geometry now looks like this, okay? So at least when this parameter m is positive, the geometry is non-singular. Uh, and if we, the form of the matter is itself a black hole, we produce another horizon. Uh, and the Penrose diagram will look like this. Let's see if I can get it right. Oops. Okay. So here we have now our observer sitting inside, and uh, he can drop uh, pebbles, and they will either fall uh, uh, in the cosmological horizon, or, or she can drop a pebble, and it, it'll fall into the into the black hole horizon. Okay. Um, and the black hole horizon is distinguished from the cosmological horizon by having a singularity inside. Now, the temperatures of the two horizons are different. OK? So th this is some sort of out of equilibrium uh, solution. It's a multi-horizon out of equilibrium solution because uh, it's as if we have two thermal baths, two thermal systems, uh, interacting with each other at different temperatures, and what's going to happen is they're going to exchange uh, energy. Okay, there'll be a thermal flux, and they'll exchange energy. And what the system might look for is the most entropic configuration. So, uh, according to Bekenstein and company, the most entropic configuration is in the Einstein limit, the area. So we can sum up these areas. So this is a fun exercise. Calculate the sum of the areas and maximize uh, for all values of m that give a smooth solution. And what we discover is that the empty uh, Sitter geometry has the largest amount of entropy, even though in one case we're summing <laughs> the area of two horizons, and the other case we only have a single horizon. Gravity, with its back reaction, is clever enough to always produce uh, the empty the Sitter universe as its most entropic configuration. Okay, so there's an attractor, a thermodynamic attractor point, which is the empty static patch. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, we can ask the opposite question. We can minimize the entropy and ask what's the minimal entropy <laughs> configuration. And that is one where we bring uh, the horizons together uh, to a point where they essentially coalesce, okay? And that is known as the uh, limit of Nariai, okay? Uh, and what we can do is, uh, in this limit, push the two horizons together and zoom the geometry in, okay, to the region living between the two horizons. And if we rescale our coordinates appropriately, we produce a new solution to uh, Einstein's theory of gravity with a positive cosmological constant, which is a direct product of ds2 cross s2. Okay, this was Nariay's uh, solution. Okay, and ds2 uh, cleverly is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a geometry that has two cosmological horizons because. <laughs> Well, one very uh, abstract way of saying it is that a zero-dimensional sphere consists of two separate points. <laughs> you may or may not find that satisfactory, but the point is 
if I'm an observer surrounded by a sphere, then you know, I have all my points in my sphere and I'm surrounded by a sphere. But if I'm an observer living on a line, then I have two directions I can go in and uh, the, the analog of the horizon becomes two separated points. And that's good because what we were doing was pushing together two horizons in the first place. So ending up with DS2 across a sphere uh, seems like a natural limit. Now, you may be familiar with uh, something known as the Bertotti-Robinson universe, which is a product of ADS2 times S2. And in order to get that solution, you need Einstein-Maxwell theory, because the two-sphere has to be supported by electric flux. Okay, this is a famous solution of Einstein-Maxwell theory. But here, somehow, cleverly, uh, the positive cosmological constant gave us an analog solution without necessitating the presence of an electric flux. And the symmetries of DS2, globally at least, uh, are now uh, the SL2R uh, group. So the, one plus, uh, the 0 plus 1 conformal group, uh, and the one case where the Euclidean and Lorentzian conformal groups happen to be the same. Okay, so the representation theory that I talked about in the case of DS2 and ADS2 are quite similar, even though in higher dimensions they're very different. Okay, another fun fact, fun lecture. Uh, so, but it's also interesting from the point of view of the geometry, right? So I've pushed the geometry in a particular limit, and what it produced uh, is some sort of uh, new critical type of symmetry that wasn't the original De Sitter symmetry, but some other emergent uh, critical symmetry, okay? It's re reminiscent of some sort of RG flow, okay? Okay, very good. So what I'd like to do now... Um, I'd like to ca characterize what has to be done is to characterize a few of the features of the De Sitter horizon. Um, yes. Sorry, I have a question. In the yes. case of anti-De Sitter, you get this limit when you have a charged black hole. It's the Reisner Nordstrom limit. This is the Bertotti Robinson universe. Yes. Here in this limit, you don't get, you, you're talking about the Schwarzschild, the Sitter geometry. Yes, no charge. Somehow the cosmological constant is behaving <laughs> when positive like charge. I'm going to come back to this point. Okay, so now let me make uh, another philosophical remark. Okay, so, you know, it's my parting comment. So uh, in the last 20 years, I talked about this understanding of gravity as an emergent or collective phenomenon, and part of this understanding relates to horizons as well. The idea is that horizons are some form of holographic liquid, some sort of many-bodied, dissipative, strongly interacting quantum system, okay, and that this is the way we should think about horizons, that this membrane picture of horizons is really, in a sense, appropriate. And uh, so now when we study a horizon, a black hole horizon, for example, we really imagine that we're doing experiments, okay, on some sort of condensed matter system, on some sort of liquid, and trying to characterize the features of this liquid, okay? And so what we'd like to do, since we have a big horizon of our own to deal with, is try to put that language in the context of the cosmological horizon as well. So the question a modern version of the question of the static patch is what type of holographic liquid is this horizon? And how is it distinguished, if at all, from the kind of holographic liquid that is a black hole horizon? Okay? This is the sort of conceptual guiding principle that we have over here. <clears throat> maybe it doesn't have an interpretation as a holographic liquid, or maybe it's inconsistent with some basic principle of quantum mechanics. But this is something to be understood. This is why this is not work. These are ideas that we don't understand yet, but we probably should. OK. Because at the face of it, it seems like a reasonable question. So let's start with the most innocent thing we can do. OK. So what's the most innocent thing we can do? The most innocent thing we can do is slightly perturb the liquid uh, and see how the ripples move. Yeah? So this is, a, this is the first thing we can do without having to deal with deeper puzzles. 
So, formulated in terms of an inertial observer sitting inside, associated to this horizon, the experiment we can consider, okay, is sending a pulse of localized energy, okay, which space is curved, it's going to have a non-trivial behavior, and part of the wave is going to be absorbed by the horizon, and part of the wave is going to be reflected back. Okay? So we're setting up an experiment at the perturbative level, uh, which is a source response type of observable. Right? So, pulse, response, Green's function. Okay? So another way to ask the question is, what is the retarded Green's function at the perturbative level of a world line correlation, of a, of a world line observer? Okay? The natural observer, after all, in this static geometry is a world line observer sitting in the middle of this space. Uh, so we might as well try to append observations to this observer. What time do I finish? Then? Okay. Okay, so at the technical level, what this calculation means is uh, we'd like to solve for a, for a particular set of modes which have no flux because we'd like to test the isolated system only with our perturbation. No flux coming in from the past horizon. Okay? And waves that are singular only at the point of emission so that there are no other experiments confusing us with our own. Now, this has a name in, in, in GR and black hole physics, which has become more famous thanks to LIGO now, which is what we're calculating are the quasi-normal modes of the De Sitter horizon. Okay? That's the experiment I just described to you. And this can be done. Remarkably, it can be done analytically, as opposed to the black hole case, where we need to do numerics to calculate quasi-normals, unless we're dealing with a BTZ black hole. Okay? The reason it can be done analytically is that the sitter gives us a horizon to study with more symmetries. Okay? Schwarzschild only has SO3 cross R. Here we have a whole SO4,1. Okay, very good. Um, so let's do this calculation. And again, the calculation is relegated as a homework problem. Uh, but I'll tell you the features of the calculation. So what we need to do, again, is solve the wave equation in the static patch coordinate system with these boundary conditions. And what you will discover when you do this calculation is that you will find the equation satisfied by the hypergeometric function. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is the solution. It's given in the form of a hypergeometric function with complex parameters such that the solution near the horizon so near the horizon, the waves <coughs> behave like oscillatory waves. Okay? So, a few more features. We imagine uh, decomposing our wave in a Fourier decomposition for time and a, spatial, uh, and a spherical harmonic decomposition for the sphere. Okay? And then modes labeled by the three parameters that are purely radial, okay? So the first thing we do is a Fourier decomposition, exploiting all of the symmetries of our problem, which are the two sphere and R. These are commuting symmetries. And then we find an equation for R, and, this, and, this, uh, and the solution oscillates near the region where the geometry looks like Rindler space, which is the near horizon region, and is smooth, uh, <coughs> And then you require that it's smooth near the origin. And the requirement that it's smooth near the origin imposes a condition on the frequencies. Okay? This is where the, where the quasi-normal as opposed to normal mode comes in. So what happens when uh, you impose all of these conditions 
I'm going to work in four dimensions again. Everything I've done <laughs> has been in four dimensions, OK? I like four dimensions. Uh, And we'll find an old friend. Ah, that's what I was missing. So we find a two sets of quasi-normal modes, labeled by a plus and a minus. And funnily enough, or maybe not, we have an old friend appearing in the equation, which were the conformal weights of the operators living at scribe plus. Now they're encoded in the dissipative features of quasi-normal modes. Okay, again, some bizarre connection between our scribe plus story and our local observer story. Um, <clears throat> and there's uh, different uh, uh, flavors to this, uh, to this spectrum. So let me discuss the spectrum and let me compare it to that of a black hole. Any questions? <clears throat> OK. Oh, sorry. An n is an integer. An l is the angular momentum. And m is the mass. OK? So let's analyze this. So the minus i over here tells us that these modes decay at late times. OK? So we have our, oh, sorry. We have our Fourier expansion. We have e to the minus i omega t. Omega is minus imaginary. It's purely negative imaginary. So it decays. There's a decaying piece. This is dissipation. This is the fact that the wave gets dissipated at late times. The amplitude of the wave decays. There's a tower of dissipative uh, modes. And what this n labels is how many oscillations this wave has in this interior. Okay? And the larger the n, the more dissipative it is. Okay? Because you're sort of trying to pump more oscillations in, and it gets pushed more into the horizon. Increasing the angular momentum also increases the dissipative physics of this wave. Because indeed, if I throw something with a lot of angular momentum, what it's going to do is get closer and closer to the horizon. And so I'm increasing its chance of getting absorbed in the plasma, OK? I shouldn't use the word plasma, in the liquid, OK? Finally, when the mass of the particle is less or of the order of the dissider horizon, there's a contribution to the dissipation that's also, there's a contribution to the quasi normal that's also purely dissipative. In other words, if the Compton wavelength of the particle is of the order of the dissider horizon, you're sort of talking quite efficiently with the horizon, and you're causing a higher chance of dissipation. On the other hand, when the mass of the particle is much greater than the dissider horizon, so when your Compton wavelength is localized well within, like this room, well within the horizon, what you do <laughs> is you create a large real contribution to the quasi-normal mode, which is non-dissipative. OK? This is the reason we can have a conversation while being surrounded by 10 to the 10 to the 120 microstates. And this is what we need to understand <laughs> if we're going to classify this as a holographic liquid. So now let's compare to a black hole. Let's compare to a black hole. For a black hole, the situation is rather different. We have the black hole over here, and we have our observer making experiments from the outside. She sends a pulse and asks what happened, OK? And imagine that uh, the pulse sent has a lot of angular momentum. OK. What's going to happen? Well, a lot of angular momentum means that the pulse is going to go well away from the black hole. And the contribution of the angular momentum to the quasi-normal mode spectrum of black hole is highly real. <laughs> so what was highly dissipative for the sitter became highly non-dissipative for the, for the black hole case. 
Now let's imagine that the observer sends a very heavy particle. The heavy particle is attracted highly to the black hole and is more likely to dissipate. And so the mass of a particle contributes to the imaginary part of the quasi-normal mode. OK? Again, this is different from the de Sitter case. OK? Sorry, I did not understand this intuition very well. Why, why does increasing the mass make it more likely to fall in? Just because it's more likely to fall in. The gravitational pull causes it to be more attractive. All of this can be checked analytically in the... Well, I mean, the classical orbits are independent of the mass of the probe, right? I mean... The classical orbits are independent of the mass of the probe. OK. Let me, let me try to give an example that I know, and then we can decode it. Take the, I'm going to give a specific example, because maybe you might. Take the BTC black hole and calculate the poles of the thermal retarded Green's function. The conformal weight contributes to the imaginary part. So, so the larger the weight, i.e. the larger the particle, the larger the dissipative feature. My interpretation of that, so let's now interpret that, is that you're more likely to sort of dissipate with the system when you're a very complicated, heavy operator living inside the CFT, the dual plasma. Okay? It's diffusion somehow. Maybe the intuition is best if you have a black brain or something. <clears throat> okay, but now let's, so we're starting to see some very clear cut differences in any case between the nature of the dissipation of a de Sitter horizon and that of a black hole horizon, okay? So this is both good news and bad news. It's bad news because we need to change stuff, we don't have the answer. It's good news in that there's something interesting going on and there might be another universality class, some other type of liquid that we still have, need to understand. Let me make one more remark. Imagine adding electric charge to this black hole, OK? Uh, if we add an electric charge to this black hole, we could also endow our probe with some electric charge as well. And we could ask, how does the electric charge contribute to the quasi-normal mode spectrum? But now we have an interesting situation, because there's electric repulsion if the charges are like. And so we have a real contribution to the quasi-normal mode that goes like the electric charge. So there's a sense in which some of the physics of the mass of a particle in the sitter is behaving more like something like a conserved charge or something in the black hole case. There's, a hinder there's something that's inhibiting uh, diffusion. Okay, if we think of this as a, as a holographic liquid and these as operators that are diffusing, there's something that, that's stopping diffusion that is similar to the question of putting a charged particle in a, a near a charged black hole and it wanting to dissipate less. In fact, a fun question in ADS-CFT that you could ask yourself is what is the dual physics of this? Because from the dual point of view, the, the, he, well, here in the bulk we had a nice explanation in terms of a repulsive uh, Maxwell force. But in the dual CFT, there's no long range forces. The U1 becomes a global symmetry. And so it has to do with something configura configurational. Okay? Anyways, this is, an, this is an aside comment, a fun aside comment. OK. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. Are you talking about ADS or the sitter? No, I, I, I emphasize, first of all, uh, there's no reason for you to interpret this as a conformal weight anymore because we're, we're not at Scribe Plus. But even at Scribe Plus, uh, the bound uh, actually comes from the mass square being negative. So there's a bound on how real it can be, but not a bound on how imaginary it can be. So. <clears throat> Just to, so the, just to, well, okay. So let's go back to Scribe Plus for a second. So 
I said, if you remember, that for a massive particle, the scaling dimensions, uh, sorry, for a massive particle uh, were given by these. And well, what is the requirement from the bulk point of view is that the particle has positive mass square. But there's no bound on how heavy it can be. I mean, maybe, well, anyway, naively, there's no particle, uh, there's no uh, bound on how heavy it can be. So the imaginary part of this can be very large. But what, what it cannot be is that this is very large and real, because that would require m squared to be negative. Okay, so no tachyons. Something like the BF bound in ADS is just no tachyons in this area. And what this forces was our conditions that uh, delta is between 0 and 3, or uh, delta is 3 halves plus i nu with nu real. OK? These are the, the unit, these are the unitary reducible representations of the Euclidean conformal group. OK. <clears throat> So now let's do another experiment, just to, to probe more on the nature of this putative photographic liquid. So imagine now that we do the, the next leading uh, innocent thing, which is, well, let's allow a little bit of back reaction, OK? So we could imagine doing the following experiment. Say I have some energy, you know, a decent amount of energy, and I throw some of it uh, into the Desider horizon, causing back reaction. And I ask, how does this affect the Desider horizon? Again, something interesting happens. If at early times, if I'm sitting at early times holding this energy, the effect of it, like we saw from the Schwarzschild de Sitter solution, was to bring in the cosmological horizon. So in throwing some of this mass out, what I'm going to effectively do is bring out some of the cosmological horizon. So the effect of back reaction is to create more space between the observer and the horizon. Now let's think about a black hole, OK? And there are nice solutions where you can check this, these Vadia-like uh, solutions. Okay? For a black hole, if I throw in a heavy amount of energy into the black hole, what's going to happen is that the black hole horizon is going to come closer to the observer. It's going to reduce the amount of ordered space between the observer and the horizon. So somehow, the back reaction in the sitter is moving in the other direction. Okay. Another distinction between the, the Sitter holographic liquid and the black hole holographic liquid. So these are data points that we're collecting on how to deal with the problem. Okay. So if we had our condensed matter friends that could engineer any microscopic system they wanted, these would be the kind of features that we'd require. The quasi-normal modes would be the kind of poles we would like to see in the retarded Green's function of our dissipative system. And when we pump the system with energy, uh, we'd like to see uh, this expansion of space, which manifests itself in, in the correlation functions of sort of heavy operators, so to speak, in our liquid, OK? All of it, just to give a, a, a speculation, might be somewhat suggestive of a system that isn't exactly in equilibrium, OK? The fact that heavy particles in the sitter don't equilibrate efficiently with a cosmological horizon, the f that there's a hindrance to, to diffusion, suggests that you know, the, the, the operators building these particles and the, and the plasma, they're not talking to each other in an efficient way. Right? The fact that uh, the, the back reaction behaves in a way opposite to that of a black hole, where the interpretation in a black hole is that the horizon moves towards you because you've created more disorder, more chaos, whereas here you've created somehow more ordered space. It sounds like there's something that's not equilibrating properly in this holographic liquid. It's just a speculation that we could think about in our, in our sort of macroscopic approach to understanding the microscopic liquid. Okay? 
So now let's try, to, let's try to become that condensed matter. So in the last five minutes, we'll try to see how, whether we can become this condensed matter observer. There was some very nice work uh, earlier, early on by Freivogel and Schenker and Rangamani and uh, Hubeni and uh, Kleban, I think, okay, that asked the following interesting question. Let's try to put the sitter inside of ADS and try to use the power of ADS-CFT to probe the physics of the de Sitter region in the interior space. The conclusion was, and they tried to embed ADS, DS4 in ADS4. Okay? Reasonable. Uh, now what happened was, was interesting. What they discovered was that the DS region always lived inside the Schwarzschild ADS horizon. And the reason had to do with the right to Turi equation. That if you, if, you follow, if you imagined a solution of that nature and you followed a null trajectory, the ADS region would cause the sphere along the land direction to contract. But then as you entered the De Sitter region, the sphere would start to expand, right? So if you remember our metric, the sitter, <clears throat> as R increases, as we go away from the maximum of the GTT component, the sphere starts to increase as we go forward along an all direction. But the Raja Dury equation says that this, unless you're in a very non generic situation, this shrinking and growing of a sphere can only happen if you violate the null energy condition. Okay, and so the way out was that the Desider region always lived inside the black hole horizon. Now there's another type of ADS you might imagine gluing your Desider to, okay, where you would like to avoid this problem. Okay, so speculation. So imagine that instead of gluing your DS4 static patch to an ADS4 asymptotic region, you glue it to an ADS2 times S2 four-dimensional region, where the two-sphere is constant in size, so we avoid the issue of the right to dury equation, and then increases in the de Sitter interior. Okay? So imagine a geometry that at very large R looks like an ADS2 cross S2 geometry, four-dimensional geometry. Or if you want, we can drop the two-sphere and do DS2 interpolating into ADS2. And to remind you, at large, at radial, at large R, the ADS2 geometry looks like R squared minus, D, minus DT squared R squared plus DR squared over R squared plus a sphere that doesn't change with R. And as R enters, starts looking more like this. Okay? Maybe then, this kind of a completion of the static patch region of the De Sitter geometry, okay, essentially a completion just of the world line, but not of the sort of full four dimension, uh, is a sensible thing to do. And then we can ask these condensed matter questions uh, in a clearer way, because we can do experiments with respect to the boundary of the ADS2 region. Okay? The whole goal, after all, was try to embed the sitter in a more complete system so that we can be able to ask sharp uh, questions about what, uh, what, how, what the features of the cosmological uh, liquid are. Now, this is, of course, highly speculative, but not inconceivable. Okay, is there a question? <clears throat> okay, so now let's, let's just end. I think this is the level of uh, speculation that I, <laughs> I'm gonna reach. Maybe I managed to confuse uh, everyone in the room. That wasn't my intention. The take home message of the last lecture is that uh, 
The De Sitter era, if the cosmological constant persists, it, everything else will dilute except the cosmological constant itself, and this is the kind of space uh, that we're going to be living in. And what's relevant to this space is the presence of a horizon, which a modern interpretation of horizon suggests some sort of many-body, strongly coupled, dissipative large-n system. And the, you know, one way to think about this uh, system is to try to, to classify and characterize the features of this horizon viewed as a holographic liquid. Okay? So the last problem uh, I'd like to leave you with is, is, is this question. It's a, it's, an open, it's a very open research question, which is what is this holographic liquid and how far we, can we get in constructing it? And an encouraging, uh, perhaps an a word of encouragement is that recently the idea of a, of a world line quantum mechanics being holographic is being revisited, particularly in the context of what's known as uh, the SYK models, okay? So ADS2, which is a theory which you have a world line and you have an emergent space coming out of the world line, uh, is, a theory that's being, is an idea that's being revisited. And given the finiteness of the static region of the sitter, perhaps a dual that's purely quantum mechanical, purely zero plus one, as opposed to a full field theory worth of degrees of freedom, might be a reasonable starting point. Okay? So, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dionysus, for the very nice set of lectures. Uh, are there questions? So, there will be a discussion session at 12, uh, so we can ask uh, Dionysus more questions then, but uh, if there are any short questions uh, before the short uh, coffee break? Okay, so I did manage to confuse everyone in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it's not surprising that inside the black hole you might need a cosmological description, right? Because your metric change is signature, so. Your metric change is signature, but your curvature doesn't. So finding a cosmology is not surprising, but finding a cosmology with positive curvature might be. Okay, if there are more questions now, let's take a half an hour break and then we'll continue with the discussion. <clears throat> okay.